So um, the different bits to the, to the work that I will be presenting today by the main part is the joint uh, work with David Shishka and Mark Sabata, uh, who are in Edinburgh, and Zan Zurich and Antoine Jacquier from Imperial College London. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I said, outline um, roughly the, the story that I want to tell you today is spread across um, three papers. One is robust pricing and hedging with new LSDs. Um, there's a tiny bit about approximating uh, power dependent PDEs with neural networks that comes in handy in that robust pricing hedging story. And if I have time um, at the end, I can tell you very briefly how um, kind of the tools that we use in quantitative finance and stochastic control in particular can shed light on um, deep learning and, 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 and set some theoretical foundation uh, for that exciting field. So I want to start with um, a bit of fun uh, and, and um, you know, why, why are we excited about machine learning? Why are we all excited about deep learning? So um, just the setup, typically um, um, we, the way that deep, deep neural networks are being used is in the context of supervised learning. So um, uh, assume that we have some IID samples, uh, science. Sorry, sorry, Lukash, uh, can I interrupt you for a moment? Yeah. It seems that there may be, oh, that was Christoph uh, saying, seems like there may be some issue with the slides, but okay, Tom, I see you're seeing it fine. I'm seeing it fine. I see a bunch of people, but okay. So it's one individual who's having an issue. Never mind. Sorry to interrupt. Continue. Right. Um, just interrupt and then and, and a minute. Um, so I have IID samples, so input output data that come from some distribution P and uh, typically that distribution P is unknown. And the goal is that we believe that there is some functional relationship that takes um, input Xi into Zeta and we would like to find that function. And uh, the way we go about it in a classical setup is that um, we would like to find a function f that is minimizing some population risk. So what, what, what is that? Is um, we fix a, a loss function L um, that measures the distance between my output data and predicted value with function f. Um, we take expected value with respect to this population uh, distribution that we don't know, and we would like that um, uh, population risk calligraphic uh, R to be small. So classically, uh, how we would go about that problem. So we fix some uh, class of functions. So um, this could be um, polynomials, you know, and these days are neural networks. Um, so that's calligraphic F. And then we solve uh, empirical risk minimization problem. So as I said, we don't know the uh, full distribution of the data. We have um, on the empirical sample. Um, so we, we, we aiming to minimize uh, that loss over some class of functions f. Um, and kind of mathematical results that um, um, are behind this is uniform uh, convergence result that tells you that um, the sort of a strong of large numbers, so Rn is empirical and R, remember, is just expected value that holds uniformly across all the functions f from the class calligraphic f. So, you know, we can, this epsilon, depending on the class of functions that we work with, you know, you get different, diff different rates. Um, and, and the idea here is that if you find a good function f uh, that minimizes empirical, um, uh, empirical risk, uh, and because we have uniform convergence, then we expect that our generalization error will be small. That, that is that function that we find will also have small error on the population measure. So this is this uh, calligraphic R without N. And the way we, we, we go about it, uh, solving this empirical risk minimization problem is that we take a fun class of functions F and loss L such that this problem is convex. Uh, However, this is a classical framework. And as we go to the neural networks and, and, and begin to work with neural networks, none of these three fundamental pillars of, of um, supervised learning work. So the, um, 
uniform convergence result does not hold those, uh, I'll show you a picture in a second, those deep neural networks are so expressive that they can fit um, noise. The, those functions are not convex, so the classical convex optimization tools do not work. Um, now, many um, local minimus, um, so that's, that, that's great, some challenge. What's, what's quite interesting, um, there is a cartoon picture taken from the paper by Belkin, paper appeared in uh, Proceeding of the National Academy of Science, that has been, that picture has been replicated on a number of different uh, learning tasks using deep learning, random feature uh, models um, across different data sets. So what it says is on the X axis, you have a complexity of the model. If when you think about a complexity, you think about um, say number of parameters in your model. If you have a polynomial, that might be the order of polynomial. And risk here on the Y axis is generalization error. So the dashed line here, the training risk, um, shows you the, um, the, the, the training uh, error. So this, this empirical risk minimization that, that, that I showed you in a moment drops down as um, complexity of the model of the class of functions um, is increasing. So, you know, if you have a data, the classical one-on-one -on -one, uh, statistic course, if you have a, in one dimensional, you have a few data points um, in Y and D, you know, you, um, if, you, if you take high and high order polynomial, then eventually you are able to interpolate for all your data points. And therefore that risk, um, minimization risk um, drops to zero. So this is what, um, what you see in this picture. But of course, the classical regime uh, of this underparameterized models is that if you, if you take a model that has many parameters um, and you begin to interpolate through your data points, then you don't expect that model to generalize well on the new data. So on the other hand, if you, if you took the model that has two little parameters, then of course you, your training error is large and you also don't expect to generalize well. And therefore the statistical learning theory would tell you that you know, there's some sweet spot um, between uh, working with a models that have too many parameters that are too expressive and not uh, expressive enough. However, since about in 2010, um, maybe a little bit later, uh, when people started playing with um, and working with um, deep neural networks, what well, they discovered that, you know, if you forgot about the classical world and you will start um, adding and adding more parameters to your model, working with bigger and bigger neural networks, and you train them with stochastic gradient descent, so first order method that has some randomness, mini batching, dropouts, various techniques um, uh, for doing that. They observe that even though your model has a huge number of parameters, often exceeding number of data points um, that you have, then generalization error drops down. And that from in many situations that actually the optimal generalization error is for those models that have really a huge number of parameters. So that sounds crazy at the first instance. Um, and what it means is that we effectively, when, when we work with this huge of a parameterized models, there are infinitely many solutions, those are infinitely many functions that could interpolate through my data points. Um, and even though this is a non-convex problem um, and I'm using typically first order stochastic gradient type method to find the minimum, because there are so many minima, I'm able to find them and magically almost they generalize well. So um, this is really, um, uh, a new perspective, which means that this deep neural network is not just a fun gadget that works, it's, it, it, it really um, creates um, um, uh, interesting questions um, in research that we can address. So number of papers recently that try to um, shed some light on this problem, but we are quite far from having a full understanding. Okay, so this was just a kind of motivation why I think the deep neural networks is just not the, something that, um, is hot and trendy these days, and and uh, and therefore um, we are using is there's really um, something quite exciting about this. So of course, people very quickly working on quantitative finance um, pick up this idea that say, hey, you know, this works so well in 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 um, in so many applications. Let let let's try to see uh, what we can do with this in finance. 
So I think one of the first paper was Hernandez 2016, who used neural network to learn the calibration map from the market data directly to the model um, parameters. And that seems to work um, reasonably well. Lots of people jump and started developing algorithms for solving high dimensional uh, partial differential equations, you know, pricing, pricing operator typically satisfies a, a partial differential equations, many um, control problems, um, uh, solutions to the control problems in form of Hamilton, uh, Jacobi Bellman equation, RPDs, um, and if we would like to solve those in high dimensions, typically this is a very hard problem. Um, nonetheless, uh, uh, recent years produce um, a, a whole array of different algorithms that uh, mix neural networks and, and, and demonstrate that this works um, um, quite well, um, despite high dimension. Um, there was a really nice paper uh, written by Blanca Horvat in 2019 that um, uh, she showed that um, having good approximation to your parametric pricing operator. So what I mean by this, if you're pricing derivatives um, and your model depends on several parameters, depending on the model, I don't know, vol of vol, interest rates, um, you name it, you can use what she has done. She used the Monte Carlo samples among, uh, of those uh, prices of different derivatives under different parameters, and then use neural network to learn this. And once you have a, this parametric approximation, so the prices of your derivatives for different combinations of parameters of your model, then you can, is a deterministic function that you can use um, and, uh, and calibrate your derivatives really quickly. Um, and then of course, another um, uh, influential idea is that um, of course, when we want to hedge derivatives and, and account for transactional costs, um, in and, and we want to hedge high dimensional portfolio, then we can also use um, we can use uh, uh, deep neural networks. And there was a nice paper by um, Hans Bieler, Bernwood, and Josef Teichmann and the co-authors. So that's one string. As I said, this this is this idea of using neural nets to enhance numerical approximation. Um, so 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 in this first round of papers that I presented. We start with a fixed model um, that is coming from finance or well-defined financial problem. And we use neural network as a effectively very efficient numerical procedure. However, recently there has been uh, work um, to um, also use ideas coming from machine learning to, to start building a new models. And one idea uh, that is gaining um, traction is so-called market generators. Um, um, I will explain in a moment a little bit more what, what these guys are. So these are um, essentially models um, built to um, directly uh, using market data uh, in a slightly different way that you know typical econometrics models uh, are, are built. And, and this is quite exciting um, because in many uh, applications in, in, in machine learning, there's very successful applications, even if you think about I don't know, self-driving cars or you know, playing Go and all of that. The, the important part there is that um, the models are being trained actually on synthetic um, data sets. So you know, you, when people build or even solve high dimensional big reinforcement learning problems, um, often um, the cost of exploration is really high. You, know, you cannot just go and, 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 and start um, learning things online. You, you, you build simulator and you train those, those models in some synthetic environments. So this is interesting area of research. Um, and, and, and recent work um, by um, Josef uh, Teichmann and, and Krista Kushiro on using, um, combining neural networks with SDs to uh, bypass the, um, to do the calibration without uh, computing the peer volume. So this is quite related to all what I will present today. Okay, so I've mentioned, um, are there any questions to that so far? Uh, so far, there, are, there aren't any in the chat box yet, but I'll, I'll let you know when there are. All right. Feel free okay. to, to type in your questions as you go along. Okay, thanks. Okay, so generative modeling. So this is um, this 
slightly different um, take on building models. So in finance, if you think about this, um, the way the financial models, economic, economic, uh, economics models um, were built is, you know, we go collect some data, gather some st uh, statistical properties or stylized facts as we call them. And with that, then we um, build typically a parsimonious model, as I said, you know, this classical setup um, that I presented in the first few slides about supervised learning is where we were always aiming at finding models that have not too many parameters to not overfit. So this handcrafting features, if you like, uh, what is called in, in um, machine learning community. And once we, we, we fix the model that we think is good, can explain the data, all those stylized facts that we have uh, discovered, you know, we calibrate and, and check whether that's true. And if it's not, you know, you go back to the draw and, and you try to improve your model. So that's what has been happening in quanti quantitative finance for the last you know, for 30 years. You know, people started with a simple black shoulders and then they realized, okay, it's not, um, maybe volatility is not constant. So then there was, um, local volatility model that we can calibrate it to data, but uh, maybe the dynamics of the model is not exactly uh, what it should, and the hedging errors are, are large. So then with this stochastic volatility model, rav volatility model, uh, you name it. And, and so we are in that process of, of, of uh, creating those handcrafted parsimonious models for, for a good number of years. And of course, the model complexity wasn't desirable because the more parameters there is, the more, more um, expensive it is to, to, to calibrate those. Um, and also, you know, we wanted to always understand how things work. So, like I said, um, advantage uh, parameters typically because it's a model that you build is parsimonious. So you understand uh, your model quite well and what the, the meaning of the parameters, relatively easy to calibrate with relatively small amount of data. Um, and typically those models, uh, we, we understand the, the foundation behind it. It's SDE and sometimes various models. The disadvantage, um, there is no really a, a, a systematic framework for model selection. This is a little bit ad hoc. Um, by fixing the model, um, we face you know, unknown of unknowns. We don't know exactly uh, what we're not capturing. And because the models are simple, um, they have limited expressivity. So um, the, the generative models, the way the people in, in, in machine learning community go about this, um, um, the and two popular uh, types of generative models uh, or classes are the generative adversarial networks of variational autoencoders. Um, great success. Um, so the idea is, and I presented a little bit using a, a perspective coming from optimal transport, you start um, with some source initial distribution and there is a target distribution uh, new, so uh, input, output. Um, you could think about data, I, I prefer to think about distributions. And the purpose of generative model really is uh, to construct the map that takes you from that initial distribution new to the uh, target um, distribution new. And so we can write it as T hash um, uh, mu. And so how, how people in machine learning go about this is, okay, we're looking for this map, we can parameterize this. Um, and the choice uh, typically is, um, uh, some architecture of neural network, but you know, a standard Heston model and a quantitative model is exactly uh, 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 does the same job. You, you can start from some initial distribution and, and you're trying to find that map that takes that, uh, that initial distribution could be a, a noise in the Brownian motion and you're trying to map um, that noise into the distribution that you um, uh, of a liquidity traded derivatives from the market. Um, so then once you have this parametric approximation, so the calibration in, in finance is that you're trying to find a parameter theta star such that um, you hit this uh, terminal distribution. And then you need to we need to decide you know, how we measure, we need to measure the, the error. Um, and so, so typically um, what happens, we need to uh, pick some metric, um, 
here I'm working with probability distributions. Um, so I need to choose a sum metric um, on the space of the uh, probability measures. And, 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 and popular ways to look at the um, difference between expected values with respect to um, my target distribution and those um, learned um, through um, map T. And then I take a supremum over some class um, of functions. Those, those functions could be um, um, you know, options traded that I'm interested that I want to calibrate to, or if you're interested in some more um, mathematical uh, um, applications, F could be a class of Lipschitz functions and then you will have a Wasserstein distance. So that's a kind of um, very quick review what the generative model is. But important uh, remark here is that, um, you know, is what are the modeling choices that we're making here? So one modeling choice is the metric D that we selected to, to, to learn the model. The second obvious is the parametrization of T. So whether it's a neural network or some, like I said, some econ econometric model. But really the key, um, which is a little bit overlooked, um, is that algorithm that is used to train that model to find those parameters is also um, um, uh, your modeling choice. So, you know, that's that shift. That's what I presented in this picture uh, at the beginning of a presentation. In the old classical world, you know, typically the problem is convex. There's one set of parameters that um, in underparameterized models fit the data. And, you know, there might be more or less efficient computational methods to find this parameter, but they shouldn't, you know, the final outcome shouldn't um, uh, um, change too much. In those, um, more modern approaches uh, that start with hugely overparameterized models or, para or models that have a huge number of parameters. What happens, as I showed you, you know, we train those models uh, to the point that the training error is almost zero or close to zero. And that's typically when, those, when the training is terminated. Um, and, and so we effectively almost interpolating for data points and that many choices of possible parameters that could give us this small training error. And this is this training method that effectively is selecting the model for us. So this is this implicit way of um, um, building models. So um, good to keep that in mind. And, and advantages of, 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 of using this um, generative models with neural networks is that um, they, they, work, it's, they work really well in high dimensions purely data-driven um, um, and provide interesting perspective on, on many problems in finance. Uh, disadvantage, parameters, we lose interpretability because we work with many, um, with, with hugely other parameterized models. Um, training uh, might be data hungry. Um, models uh, might be a bit challenging to, to work because they, complete, they look completely different I'm talking about those based on neural networks than what we are used to. And so for example, it's not clear how I can go from risk neutral measure to real, a real world measure. Um, and, and the field is largely empirical. So we still, um, we don't have a well-established foundation as we have for many models in quantitative finance. Okay. So this is a, a little bit long um, um, introduction now, um, the main thing and the, the idea I want to tell you about is um, how you could combine those um, neural network um, uh, effect, neural network based models that are very effective and have some, you know, clear advantages with more classical uh, frameworks that we know much more. So, like I said, super quickly, um, you know, I, I, I show you the, um, um, the ideas behind generative models, but this is just the example. Um, or calibration in finance is exactly an example of, 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 of generative model. Um, the only difference is that typically in finance, um, as your model, you will select some stochastic differential ETO process or some econometric model that will also depend on the parameters. Um, that model will induce, um, when in the context of pricing derivatives, will induce a martingale measure, uh, Q theta. And then you will go and collect uh, uh, prices of traded derivatives. So this is this um, uh, calligraphic P uh, with a phi being a payoff. And then you want to find the parameters of your model so that you are 
your, your model is correctly pricing um, the um, traded derivatives. Okay, so this is exactly the same as for the generative models. The only difference is that slightly different loss function and, and, and the cluster functions that we're working. But again, you know, there might be that there may be many different models that fit the data. Um, so about 15 years ago, um, people in quantitative finance started working with the um, so-called robust approach to finance. And that's, there is this realization that there will there are many martingale measures um, or models that induce martingale measures that, that, that could calibrate the data. And so maybe one should take a conservative approach. And if we want to use um, this trained model to price um, some path dependent derivatives or, or use this for risk management, we should be computing the upper and lower bounds. So rather than just computing a price or value, we should be producing intervals. And um, so there's this idea and there is a nice mathematical theory, including duality that allows you to even not only compute those prices, but also hedges. Uh, but that robust finance, um, as far as I know, didn't get that much traction in practice. And the reason for that is that those models, sorry, those bounds um, that you, you get from, from the theory are quite big. And so um, um, they're not always practical. So of course, the natural idea is um, maybe we should, instead of working with all possible models that could calibrate to data, uh, we could restrict um, 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 space M. Um, and then we would like to do that in such a way that um, it's easy to search for the model that is calibrated to, to data. So what is um, the model that we, we, we present that I, I think can do that is this neural SD. So I, I think it falls kind of as an intersection of a classical modeling, generative models, and have some elements of robust finance. So, um, so idea is, in fact, very simple and, and quite flexible. Um, so we like our classical quantitative finance models because we understand them and they have lots of good properties. We know when they martingales and when they not, when they induce arbitrage or when they do not induce arbitrage. Um, and we have a lot of theory um, uh, how to use them and how to combine them in a stochastic control setting. So the idea is that we start with a stochastic, with something that looks like stochastic differential equations, but in place of coefficients, so sigma, sigma s, um, so volatility of the price process and the uh, drift and the volatility of the vol process, we can put neural networks. We don't need to, we can, you know, we can, if, if, if you have confidence about some of those functions, what they should be, you can put them so you can mix and match um, and you can, you know, decide whether you want to work with just price process and stochastic volatility or some other type of models and whether you, you want this to be driven by Brownian motion rough. Um, rough um, um, process or jump, it's, 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 it's completely flexible. Um, and also you can work with a standard time series. But the idea is that you, you maintain that dynamic. So you we impose the structure on our model. Um, and, um, but we want to gain flexibility of neural networks in that, that if I, if I'm using those approximations, uh, th those coefficients to be um, neural networks, they're very, um, um, in, in, you know, for universal approximation theory, we know that those can approximate um, any continuous function. So the class of models that I'm, class of SDs that I'm considering here is very large. And like I said, because it's a, it's a SDE, um, then I can very easily switch between pricing measure and, and risk neutral measure. So depending what I'm interested in risk uh, or I'm interested in pricing. Um, solution map, interestingly, there is um, again, um, people are more interested in maybe um, some mathematical aspect. There is um, uh, people working on this robust finance uh, recently uh, brought about interesting ideas from causal transport. So this is optimal transport that is adapted to the um, uh, filtration generated by the, um, um, by the, you know, whatever randomness we have in the system. So here, uh, SDE is is just the example of that. Um, 
And like I said, there is related work uh, using um, uh, combining local stochastic volatility model uh, and, and approximating um, approximating the pure volatility part of neural network uh, kind of appear at the same time from Krista and Jose. Um, so here I work with neural networks. There's also a version, we have a version of the paper when instead of working with neural networks, we, we work with signatures of the path, but it's a separate story. Um, yeah, I said it's the a flexibility of, of, of changing measures I think is quite important. Okay, so how we, how we can go about it and price it and calibrate it, how we can find those parameters. So, you know, typically, you know, that um, a folklore knowledge was that using Monte Carlo for calibration is perhaps not a brilliant idea because there's a large variance and that not always works. Um, but um, that's how the whole um, supervised learning setup uh, it, uh, operates this day. So um, we gave it a go and, and I'll show you that it works pretty well. So as an initial example, we take some loss function L. We have uh, um, prices of the, the derivatives uh, traded in the market for some pay of um, T. And so um, I want to make this, I want to find a parameter theta so the distance between the price induced by my model and the market data is small. If I'm interested in hedging, um, um, sorry, this is not hedging. If I'm interested in, uh, in this upper and lower bounds, I show you there is this um, idea of robust uh, pricing. I will be interested in finding a parameter theta L um, uh, alpha lower bound that minimizes some um, quantity of interest that could be say part dependent derivative of, of whatever you like uh, within the class of models that are calibrated to the to the uh, market data and the same for the upper I might be interested in maximizing the price within all uh, possible models that um, um, these neural SDs that I have subject to um, being calibrated to market data um, so very easy. One small remark. Um, so this is our, you know, for simplicity, we take just uh, that we want to calibrate to one price um, for this little computation. So this is our loss function. Um, we will be training uh, this using gradient descent method. So I want to compute derivative with respect to the parameter theta. And when you do that, you end up with this expression, right? So you just compute the derivative of the loss function times the derivative of the, um, the derivative of your uh, payoff. And here we assume that I can exchange more derivative inside expectation. If I, if I couldn't, I could use uh, some Malavian weight or, um, um, for example. Okay, but then when you compute this derivative, and now you will, uh, we would replace those measures Q with the um, empirical measures Qn. Then, um, of course, the expected value of this guy is not equal to that because you know it's a product. Um, so in general, this is a biased estimator of of this guy. Um, so you have two choices here. Uh, one is called, um, I think I recently was covered a couple of weeks ago in reinforcement learning double sampling problem that you could generate two independent batches of models for this guy and for this. And so this will become independent, um, but then the, the cost of doing that is, is, is double or you just ignore that fact and and um, we have we have this lemma in slightly, proof for slightly more general setting, but in the specific case of the square loss function, if you look at the difference at the bias of your gradient, um, uh, you can show that this guy is bounded by the variance of your payoff. Okay, so now if you're thinking about okay, we're doing some Monte Carlo. Um, approximation when we when we want to calibrate these models. So this variance of this guy's guy will play an important um, role. So the um, so what we do, uh, we, we need to in order for this calibration process, um, Monte Carlo calibration process to be efficient and also um, there are side benefit to being able to compute uh, corresponding uh, hedging strategies. 
we need to learn a controlled variant and we do that via learning um, PDs. So um, a, a, a tiny detour um, is that I'll, um, we take some parametric um, and we can do it in a parametric way. We, we take a SD, um, so this could be this with the neural network um, uh, without the drift, so in the martingale, uh, under the martingale measure. Um, and then we compute, uh, let's say you have a, you have a price um, of maybe power dependent derivative, um, um, because remember we, that, that's what we will be interested in this upper lower bound. We, we, not, we, we want to be able to compute um, um, prices of, 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 of things that might depend on the trajectory. Um, so you know that we have uh, the price uh, being a martingale uh, satisf uh, satisfied martingale representation uh, theorem. So martingale representation theorem tells you that your price, uh, that is this conditional expected value of the derivative is a payoff itself minus the stochastic integral and so typically in martingale representation theorem you don't know this process but um, in the Markov setting, you can use a PD theory to, 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 to realize that this is a gradient of your um, payer function. Um, uh, and then um, in the power dependent setting, you can, you can also do the same using notions of uh, Dupier function into calculus. Um, so you have this Martingale representation theorem. Important thing here is that remember um, the expected value of this guy will be zero. So the idea of using this, um, using Martingale representation theorem to construct control variate is that if I want to compute the price that is expected value of the payoff for my Monte Carlo estimator, I can take the whole this guy instead. So I can subtract something that has expected value zero. But the advantage here is that the variance of all um, this guy, what I have on the uh, right-hand side is zero. So conditional variance conditioning on this trajectory. Why? Because, you know, this is a number of con conditioning uh, on, on, on this um, trajectory. So therefore has a variance zero. So of course, in real life, I need to, um, you know, I need to approximate this integral. So it not exactly will be zero, but that gives you idea how I can learn, how I can learn the gradient. Um, sorry, this is a typo. It shouldn't be, if I, it should be F. Um, and this F can be sure to satisfy some uh, PD that I can learn the gradient of, 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 the, um, of the PD that gives me a way to reduce the variance of my Monte Carlo. So I have a paper on that um, if you're interested. Okay, so I have now components. So I need to reduce the variance when I'm calibrating. This is, this is um, really important um, for this to be efficient. So what we do here is you take you set some grid time discretization. Uh, you take um, uh, input. So these are some option payers that you're interested. You take market option prices. Um, you then generate, you generate um, uh, trajectories with your neural SDE. And then you do um, the following for um, each epoch or batch of your, of your um, data with the um, parameters of your hedging strategy. So remember this, this, this is the guy that comes from Martingale representation theorem that corresponds to hedging. You freeze this guy and you minimize this distance. So we want to calibrate. So we want to have expected value of this, expected value of the hedging strategy should be about zero. Uh, and this is the price of the derivative. So I'm trying to find the parameter theta. So the parameterization of the drift diffusion of, um, and vol of vol of my neural SD so that I'm, I'm, I'm calibrating this. And then of course you don't know hedging strategy. So with freeze model, then I'm trying to learn my hedging strategy and the way I'm doing this is by minimizing that variance. I know that the variance should be zero for my perfect hedge. Um, and there's different ways to set, to set up this optimization problem, but that's one of the setups that, that work for us. And then you oscillate. So you improve your model, you improve your hedge. And, and, and um, that's how we go about it. Um, so some results. Um, 
we uh, we were working. We took a, a local stochastic volatility model, so we we generated the synthetic data here um, using um, um, a fixed model, and we computed um, uh, prices for call options across um, several strikes and maturities. And and then we want to compute. Um, we are computing the prices of of, of various derivatives, for example, look back. Um, and so what you can see here, um, here we are fitting um, uh, calibrated market data and implied vol um, and, and uh, of the calibrated neural SD. So you see we're getting a, a, um, a pretty good fit. So we, we repeat that 10 times um, uh, to see what's, uh, what the variance we're getting. Um, so that works uh, pretty well. And then what we do here in this picture is this idea of robust uh, pricing of computing intervals. Um, and so the, what you see here, so we have a pictures across different uh, maturities for eight, 10 and 12 months. So what you see, uh, the, this bar plots, um, the middle guy is, um, so this guy, if you see my mouse, is a price of look back option um, with a neural SD. And we computed um, um, the several prices. Um, and the only, and each time we are computing the price, we are we calibrating our model. The only thing that we've changed was the initialization of the, of the um, um, initialization of a stochastic gradient used at the training. And so we're randomly selecting, changing, uh, we, we're changing initialization of our stochastic gradient in the calibration. And each time that stochastic gradient is finding slightly different model and that's slightly different model is producing different prices of the path dependent derivatives. So that's why we have those bounds. So then we said, okay, can we be, can we be more systematic about this? And so this is this idea of the inter intervals. So these guys here, this lower one and upper one is the that we are computing the maximum price within the class of models that are calibrated. We do that with uh, so solving augmented Lagrangian, um, and so we are getting price intervals and we're getting a corresponding hedging um, strategies for this um, uh, variance reduction. Uh, Martin, the representation that I show them, yeah, we repeat this across. Um, so I think this is interesting because, you know, when you use neural networks, it's also important to quantify your uncertainty. So this ideas that we use in finance, you know, can be also um, used uh, to some extent um, in uh, machine learning applications. So um, this is just a picture to show you the difference uh, in training be uh, between um, the calibration when using control variate and, and all this hedging strategy and not. So we see that the blue one is with control variate. So we get a better accuracy and the training is more stable. Um, um, and we recently tested this idea for, um, we asked the questions. And so this is the work with Antoine and Zan um, Can we can we use this neural SD and, and can we uh, calibrate to um, uh, SPX and VIX? So this is a um, challenging problem that the many classical models are not, um, are, are not able to do that. So again, we have um, uh, our uh, neural SD setup. We, we take VIX um, and we compute the forward for VIX. So this is this F and, and then consider the calls and puts. And then, so this is the, the result of the calibration of, of the forward. Um, uh, so it gives a good result. And then we take um, uh, both um, uh, SPA calls and puts and VIX calls and puts. And so this is on real data. Um, so the coloring here corresponds to the error and the, um, the white bits uh, are the parts that we don't have data. Um, so, so again, you get accuracy at the order, you see you know, 10 to minus um, three, uh, so that, that works um, um, pretty well. So that gives you calibration, so that shows that those models are expressive enough. So uh, lots of, um, there's many possible extensions. Um, the, I only show you this calibration to the Q uh, under, under Martingale measure. 
um, um, so the prices of traded derivatives, of course, you could extend this and you could also directly train to the tra trajectories on the real uh, real measure. And you can um, and you can use those models to train to both um, prices of, of, of you know under Q and P. And the way you go about this is you know assume you take your model, assume you took your model and calibrated it, it to the um, and the martingale uh, measure to the prices of traded derivatives. And now what you want to do, you want to effectively learn um, um, a gear sign of transformation. You want to learn a drift of your price process. So this will be this guy. Um, and then you can do that using um, historical data. And so that way, um, in principle, you can construct a process, um, um, stochastic volatility process in which you have you have learned your uh, parameters to be to fit into um, above under Q and P. Uh, and you have that you can change between the two consistently and you know, incorporate more more data into your your model. Um, so, a couple of other ideas that we're playing with um, is we could add bounds and, for example, realize variance. So you can add, start adding additional information to your model, um, where you you can say, you know, I'm interested in finding the model um, of the neural SD type that calibrates to my um, vanillas or whatever market traded derivatives. But I also want, um, I'm betting that my realized variance is within certain bounds. I'm only interested in those kind of models. So you can start adding constraints um, and doing that. It's as you're adding those constraints, the training gets a little bit more tricky. Uh, so I'm not saying this is a super straightforward. Um, um, yeah, you can, you can um, also use some robust, um, uh, trying to find hedging strategy that will work on, on, not only on the market data, but go beyond market data. Um, and um, um, there's some connections to explainable machine learning because you fix the model and, and so you impose some structure of the model. So um, advantages of this approach, I think, is that um, you, know, you, have a, you have a way of combining the, all the new. Um, it seems work, it, it, it works well. Um, um, it's relatively efficient, and, and uh, but you're staying in the framework of the classical models that we know and understand uh, quite a bit. Um, nonetheless, individual parameters you still work with are models that has many parameters. So one 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 actually thing that we're looking at the moment is um, once we've learned those functions, can we can we simplify them? Can we represent them by something much more familiar or less? Um, um, that has less a uh, small number of parameters, but this is working progress. So I think I ran out of time. Um, I have another part of the talk, but um, um, this is uh, on the mathematics of deep learning. So maybe on a different occasion. So I skip that. Um, thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks a lot, uh, Lukash, for a very interesting talk. Uh, we do have, so I'll just remind everyone that uh, if you have questions, please type them into the chat or just at least say you have a question and I'll call upon you. There uh, was a question earlier on. I didn't feel it was, was good to stop you. So I, I will let you call okay. upon your questioner now. Um, Jalal uh, Arab Nehdi, would you like to turn on your camera and unmute yourself and ask the question? Yourself? Hi, hi. Thank you for the talk, actually. Very interesting talk. I had two questions. The first one was uh, related to neural STEs. Is it related to two time scale uh, reinforcement learning? Because deep reinforcement learning is basically similar to what you're doing right now. They have the dynamical system that the one we can represent it by STEs. And they, they basically, they try to formulate all, uh, every coefficient with some neural networks. So they have two time scale networks and they try to basically do the similar stuff like similar procedure. Are you familiar with that or is there something that I'm missing here? I'm not familiar with a specific term, two, two time scale. Uh, there are so many different terms used in so many different contexts in machine learning, but um, we have, um, so what I presented here uh, was about calibration, fitting into the data. 
Um, you could think about those parameters as a control. We have another paper and the other talk that I didn't present um, was about interpretation of control. So what you can have is that you can think about using those neural SDEs in the context of um, model-based reinforcement learning in which you know, I'm saying that I, I assume that my model is of the form of the SDE or the specification of the SDE with some parameters and functions that I don't know. But in addition, I have a control. I have some policy that I'm trying to optimize. And I can, uh, what I can do is I could, you know, optimize, use, use the model to, to find an optimal control and then interact with the environment to collect the data to update my view on the model and update the parameters. Um, uh, so I think this would be super interesting, uh, I think, to do. We, we, we thought about it, but we, 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 haven't, we haven't tried that yet. Um, but uh, I think this would, be, this would be really exciting. And the reason for that is that it would potentially, you know, I think it's, you know, it's called model-based reinforcement learning, but for people coming from more quantitative finance and being more familiar with working with a stochastic control using some uh, stochastic differential equations that would provide a bridge between um, reinforcement learning and st stochastic control in stochastic control where you have a fixed model um, and reinforcement learning where you don't have a model and here you have something, something in between that, you know, you, you have some idea what your model should be, but you don't know, um, you don't know exactly what that is. Thank you. That's just a very quick uh, question again. So there is a fundamental like uh, controversy right now uh, the, between like people in theory and uh, those who are in practice. Is deep uh, representation always better? I mean, especially when it comes to robust cyber attacks, controlled uh, applications. Is it something that uh, you would uh, use yourself as a person who has worked in mathematics for several years? You mean uh, what I use, what I would use neural networks? Or? Yes, yes, yes. Would you suggest that to an industry if someone wants uh, to use that for control purposes? That where, for example, those who are like keen to cyber attacks, to robust, uh, to guarantees, basically. Um, so this is quite a you know a, a broad question. So I would say that um, the from control, uh, control uh, perspective, those, those neural networks have been extremely successful. If you think about um, the many big success of uh, reinforcement in uh, recent years, you know the biggest, the biggest uh, methodological uh, workhorse of that is that we solve still we, we are still solving uh, approximate dynamic programming equation of, of some sort of maybe mm. or, or a policy gradient, but. Um, we're using neural networks to approximate the um, policy and the value function. So I think, yes, you know, this, this, this works really, really well. Um, however, you know, at the moment, this is, um, you know, very new field. So, you know, we, we've, we've, we've been working with control theory for, you know, at least 50 years or 70, um, um, having a, you know, statistical standard theory of statistics and estimation and learning theory again, you know, 70 years and that excitement on, on deep learning really started about, you know, 10 years ago. So there's lots of things, there's lots of tricks and, and engineering uh, hacks that um, we still don't fully understand on the, on, on the theory side. And we not always, we, we cannot always provide uh, guarantees. There is exciting research. I'm, 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 I'm involved um, a little bit in that on, um, verification and validation for the neural networks. Um, so this is a part coming from computer science um, and you would like to provide certification and some sort of guarantees under which you know your neural network has certain properties or, or, or behaves in a certain way, but it's um, relatively recent research and we need, we need a little bit more time. Thank you. Have. Thank you. And being able to provide those guarantees in, in, in all the setups that we care. Sorry, I stopped sharing actually. Actually, I was going to ask you to put it back on because, in fact, there are some requests for particularly oh. your, uh, your reference slides. If you could just keep it up on the screen, some people oh, want it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I can share, um, I don't know what I have, I can sh send you the slides after. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that the, the seminar will be posted uh, on Fields Institute's site probably 
within a, within a day or two, uh, so you can check back for, for for the seminar as well as previous ones. Uh, so, oh, okay, Christoph just posted exactly the link for where the seminars will be hosted. That's great, thanks, Christoph. So I, I had a question. Um, what, in fact, you partly answered it. But, you know, at, at one point you said when you're modeling with mural SDEs under the Q measure, and then you said that it'd be easy to go between P and Q, but then I thought, don't you need to specify your market price of risk? How do you get it? Like, just like that, because it's certainly not uh, a unique, uh, unique Martingale measure, but you're, the way that you're doing it is, is by specifying the rad derivative in a parametric way, right? With the zeta process, okay. Right, and then this induces an appropriate market price of risk. And I guess you want to simultaneously calibrate to P evolution as well as the, the option prices. Okay, okay, correct. Um, I did have one more. I don't see any pertinent questions coming up in the chat at this moment. But so I had one other about um, the robust pricing. So I, I know one of the comments you made was that people didn't, don't like or I shouldn't say don't like, it didn't really take off having robust pricing, have these really wide bounds in prices. But yet you, you then went on to do some variation of robust pricing, I guess constrained within the class of mural SDEs, right, is, is, the, is the idea. But the bounds that I saw you showing after the, like for the particular example, I can't really read the numbers. So it's unclear to me, does, does it really um, hone in those difficulties? Of, of having wide bounds? Yeah, so um, the, um, the answer to your question is that um, I don't know. <laughs> we, I, 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 I haven't checked that. So um, certainly the first thing I'll say is that you, um, when you work with um, the robust pricing, the, the classical robust pricing approach, you are computing those upper lower bounds for all martingale measures. Sure. Yeah. That can be calibrated to the market. So that's huge space <laughs> um, that could consist of very weird things um, that are martingale. So here you're restricting this class, the search space of the models, and you're saying, I'm only interested in the models that are um, solutions to the stochastic differential equations. So that's already a smaller class, and therefore um, your bounds would be tighter. Um, I haven't compared, you know, I haven't compared, we haven't done the computation by going to, you know, taking um, things from, you know, what Jan Hobo is working and yeah, yeah. some of the algorithm exactly for the, for the, the, for the same kind of data, what, what, what we will get here. However, this, this gives you a, um, um, a, a systematic way of, of providing more information. So for example, like I said, you know, you could say, I'm only interested in uh, models that look like a stochastic volatility. Uh, but I know that, you know, I observed that the, um, the, the, the volatility has been reverting. So maybe, you know, this is my, my belief, you know, that, that, that I don't need to learn that. Um, you know, this has this structure and more, maybe you can say, you know, I want my realized variance of the model to be within certain bounds. Mm -hmm. um, so you can start adding those constraints. And then as you would start adding those constraints, your, your bounds would shrink. What we've done in the paper, um, one experiment that suggests that what I just said is true <laughs> is that uh, we took um, as, as a test, uh, dupier vol mm -hmm. And then, you know, um, theoretically, um, if you have a continuum of strikes and maturities, <laughs> then you know there is a unique model. But of course, in practice, you have all the finite number of strikes and maturities. And so we were computing bounds and we were adding um, uh, option data at different maturities. And so as, as we were having more and more maturities, then the bounds for the exotics were shrinking. So, you know, we were providing more information, more constraints to the model, um, and, there, and then we were getting a tight data. Constraining there. Okay, uh, there are a couple more questions. So I don't know, Lugash, if you have some time to, to, to take them still. It's already- Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. No problem. <laughs> I'm happy to stick around and keep others RT. So maybe um, uh, Javed uh, Mir Mirzay, would you like to ask the question yourself? 
Uh, sure. Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just wonder in your uh, robust model, there are certain coefficients, I mean, the drift volatility term, they are parameterized by certain, uh, you know, uh, features. How is this, um, I mean, the coefficients are generated, are they generated by uh, the generative model that you explained at the beginning or, uh, I mean, the distribution of these in order to, to uh, to, to calibrate for, uh, let's say, the uh, robust hedging, uh, I mean, the candlestick that you showed before. Um, yeah, thanks. So, I mean, the, that, that generative model that I presented was maybe, um, um, it was a motivation to say, look, this is what's happening in machine learning is very successful. Um, but in fact, what we're doing in, in, in finance is very similar. Uh, uh, in, with the difference that we work with econometric or models of stochastic differential equations versus neural networks. So here, uh, the, those functions are um, uh, given by some neural network in, in, in those numerical experiments that we were working, we were taking uh, fully connected feed forward um, neural networks. Uh, the, they, but this can be, so, so we learned this, we learned those functions um, in the process of, of, of pricing derivatives. But you could, if, if, if you like, you could see this, um, of course, as, um, as uh, just an example of a, a generative model. Um, and the way to do that is, you know that if you have a solution to the stochastic differential equation, um, and you know that you have a strong solution, which we can we, we have. I can always add conditions on those um, networks that will guarantee that. That solution to the stochastic differential equations is a map, a function that takes initial condition, Brownian trajectory, and it gives you solution. Um, so we will have, of course, you know, the map that takes parameter theta, Brownian trajectory, Brownian trajectory being that. Um, latent variable, as in 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 in, in generative uh, generative model, um, initial condition, and 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 that's what we're learning. Um, so this is just an example. Um, but but you know, in generative model, you just typically say, well, let let my generator be just some neural network. And here, uh, we are imposing a specific structure. I want my it's still neural network like but um, it's of the form of SD. I think personally um, that um, this is where this research of deep neural network is heading that, you know, it's, it's very, it's great. And there are some applications like image classifications or maybe text or something like that, that I don't care so much about the model so long as it does a good job. But many, many applications, you would like to add some prior knowledge um, into, um, into your training. And, and this is one example of that. You know, I have a prior knowledge that uh, the SDs are good types of models to work with when you want to um, do, you know, I don't know, quantitative risk management. Um, and so, you know, it's one, one way to fix that, my prior knowledge that I think this is a good model. Okay. Uh, um, yes, just a quick follow up. Uh, so oh, with yeah. that, so, uh, so you're saying, there is an independence from time to time, time to time for these coefficients. It's just a function of few parameters, right? Yeah. So how, how do you capture if there is correlation between time to time for these uh, coefficients? I'm not sure that, uh, what do you mean capture? Uh, co let's, say, let's say from time instance one to two, uh, these, that's a sigma term is, uh, uh, they're correlated uh, with each other, right? So, but here it, it's just captured with some few point theta t and x t x actually what I see. Uh, so let's say from the previous time, how do you capture the correlation between sigma one and sigma two, for example? So I mean, depends how you want to set this up. So you know, I mean, you could actually pick that. Um, assume that I don't want my sigma to depend on time. I want to have one parameter. I want to have one function that works across. Um, the one way when we were calibrating this to many maturities, we, oops, sorry, um, I have some, let me come back. As, as we were uh, calibrating this to many maturities, we would um, first find a sigma at the first maturity that gives me a good fit. Uh, 
then I fix that parameter and then you know I could I learn a second sigma that gives me fit to the second maturity and 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 I continue that way so we were interested in a calibration to uh, vanilla now if if in the setup that I would like to be um I would like to fit my SDE to some time series data you know, under measure p that's a little bit different um I didn't. I didn't. I didn't tell much about this. It, it's very demand. It very much depends what you're trying to capture. So you know, I'm I'm often interested in a situations that, um, and we have some other paper about this that we try to capture the whole distribution um, of the on the path space of trajectories. Um, and so we'll be considering some you know metric, uh, suitable metric. But you know, maybe I could I could train. And so this is how the loss function comes into the, the picture and is your modeling choice. Maybe I could you know, fix that. I, I want to make sure that autocorrelation function of my neural SD fits autocorrelation function of the time series that I'm trying to calibrate it to. So you know, it depends what you want to do and, and how you want to go about it. Um, you have that choice. Okay, so um, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, for, uh, for the uh, interesting questions. We have one last, I'll take one last question. Uh, there was a couple more coming after that, but the slides will be posted uh, and, this, and the seminar as well, which I think will address that last question from Yanis. But um, Leonard, I think you had a question that you would like to ask. Yes, uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm Leonard Wong. So I'd like to ask about the, the choice of the architecture. So in, in the applications of deep learning in let's say image processing, the choice of the architecture is of uh, is very important. So here, do you have any specific things to say about the, the architecture you use? I mean, I, you just mentioned that you use the fully connected networks, but in certain applications, do you expect that other architectures could be of a uh, could be much more? For example, suppose I want to model a large number of stocks, and I know that the stocks are in different industries and they're affected by different economic factors. Then perhaps some other ways of connecting the network could be better. Yeah, thanks. That's a very good question. Um, we haven't um, we haven't experimented. We thought about using convolutional nets, um, but we were thinking about this from the perspective of uh, how efficient this will be at the training stage. Um, it's not immediate to me why that um, should be better because you know the reason you use convolutional nets when you do classification of images is that different parts of image are being learned at different layers. I, I, I struggle a little bit with with that when thinking about the calibration to the um, to the um, option prices. Mm -hmm. However, in 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 this one slide <laughs> that I presented about a way of learning PDEs uh, with neural networks, specifically, I was interested in learning hedging strategy or gradient of my of my uh, pricing operator. There, um, in the paper that we put on our camp, I don't know, last Friday, maybe on Monday, uh, we, we want to learn path dependent PDE. And so the standard feed forward neural network are not doing such a great job. So there we use LSTMs and, and we also combine LSTMs with a signature. So, you know, if I, if I have the temporal dependence, then, then um, um, or, you know, for example, it is this neural SDEs, I, here I took Markovian, Models, but I could equally uh, consider non-Markovian models. So I could have functions that take a path trajectory rather than just you know point in time at every, at every time slice on the uh, value of the of the process of MT. And if I do that, then we would um, we would use uh, some variation of recurrent neural network um, to be able to capture the temporal dependence.